Here we go. All right, we're just getting ready to get started. About one more minute, giving a few more people time to get on, and then we'll get started tonight. So amazing there is people listening to this in the morning. <laughs> people in Sydney. Yeah. A lot of different times. <clears throat> well, at least it's not the middle of the night for them, like it might be for some of our friends. And <laughs> uh, well, London, it's pretty middle of the night. <laughs> okay, so shall okay. we go? Yeah, well, welcome everybody to our Treatment Tuesdays webinars. This is one in a series, as you see, we've done quite a few, those recordings are on the Classy website. And um, we're, we're so fortunate because Southpaw Enterprises uh, is helping to sponsor these webinars and they've made it possible for, for us to offer this to you through Classy. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll go ahead uh, to our, um, our topic and our speakers tonight. Okay, well, thank you so much, Suzanne, as usual, for putting together an amazing program. We keep talking about your talent that you have in bringing together just wonderful topics and speakers. And so tonight, or whatever it is for you, this morning, or whatever time it is for you, we're going to be talking about going from student to clinician and, and thinking a little bit about how we build our skills and knowledge. And we have two just fantastic speakers with us. So excited for both of them to be here. Uh, we have Dr. Jenny Peterson, who's, uh, well, they're both close to my heart, so I don't want to play favorites. But, uh, Jenny is on the faculty at St. Ambrose in Iowa which for those of you, uh, our international colleagues, that's right in the middle of our country. And she did receive her master's degree there and then her doctorate uh, at Thomas Jefferson University, where I was very honored to have the chance to work with her there uh, through her program. And she has some advanced training in autism and neurodevelopmental treatment. And she's just been really critical to us in the development of the evaluation in aerosensory integration in the EASY. She was a coordinator for one of our pilot studies and we're so excited that that study has been accepted for publication. We'll be out by next month. It should be in the November, December issue of AJOT. So that paper is coming out really soon. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And Sarah Sawyer, who we've known for so long and just been so honored to be able to work with and learn with. Sarah is the clinical director at OTA, the Kumar Center, and the president of Spiral Foundation. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in the UK. Did you just add that? Or was that? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we're really thrilled that we got to keep Sarah. Sorry about that, our friends over in the UK, but um, she came here. She was just sharing with us that she came um, thinking she was only going to spend a short time here, but has stayed here for many years since. And then she received her uh, master's degree at Tufts. And Sarah's a master clinician. Uh, she's worked in many, with many different uh, populations and has also worked in research uh, with trauma and in sensor integration. And we're just thrilled to have you both. You're just both such wonderful friends and colleagues and have made so many contributions. So let's get started. All right, well, I'll stop sharing. All right, Jenny. All right, I will pull up my screen right now. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, that was such a nice introduction. I was gonna give a little bit of information uh, 
kind of be in numbers here as well as we get started. So one, for this is my first time on Treatment Tuesday. So thank you so much to <laughs> Suzanne and Zoe for welcoming myself as well as Sarah here today to talk on building competency in air sensory integration. Uh, my next number is three. This is something kind of always laughed about because three is the number of children I have and it has kind of occurred along with my educational experience <laughs> and, and my own competency with air sensory integration. So my first child is when I re received my certificate in sensory integration. The second is starting my post-professional doctorate and then the third is at the end of it. So just kind of a little fun, fun fact and journey along the way. Four is the clinics that I've worked at and 10 is the number of years practicing in pediatrics. And then lastly, for my air sensory integration friends, um, I did this right before today, but 120 is the number of seconds that I held my prone extension for. So <laughs> just a fun little fact that I'd start us off with today. <laughs> but um, in saying that, I want you guys to think about, as we're thinking about building competency, I'm sure you can relate to and think about lifelong learning. And that's really what this endeavor has been for myself is it's a lifelong learning process. And so the goal of this presentation is to meet you with where you are at within this journey. So whether it be that you're a student in OT school a practicing clinician, a fieldwork educator, or an educator within academia, then what we're here to do is to provide you with some resources and some examples for current practices that are being implemented within academia and within clinics. And while I'll be talking on initially some information related to academia, and then Sarah will be providing lots of clinical experience and expertise uh, on that, in that role. So as we all know, skill development occurs over that period of time. And while we're developing various skills throughout life and in the field of occupational therapy, there's that targeted focus towards understanding our profession beginning within OT school. So whether it's that you're uh, receiving or working towards your doctorate degree, master's, or your um, baccalaureate degree or associate degree, this is really focused time towards learning about our profession. And I bring this up because it's such a broad area and so much information that we're trying to gather at this time that in fact, since I'm on, since I'm on the roll with numbers, there's 130, over 130 standards that you are learning about within OT, within OT school. So again, I wanted to speak to though, why we're all in different areas and different spots along this journey with air sensory integration. And that's because while there are uh, standards that speak to cognition and to sensory and to children development and to context, there's not standards that state a specific theory that, ha that um, is required to be taught within any of the programs. But there is some interesting literature in that while there's not specific standards related to what must be taught while you're in OT school, there's outstanding information to say that a good percentage of us are utilizing sensory integration theory in pediatric practice. And on top of that, while there's this high number of pediatric practitioners utilizing this theory, there's also a high percentage of educators that are providing information, but, it, but it's, it's varied. So it could be that you've had one or eight hours worth of lecture material or one or 12 hours worth of lab observation. So this just kind of gives rationale as to why we're all starting out at a different spot in this journey. So for academia purpose or fieldwork educator purpose, I wanted to provide a little bit of information about how sensory integration could be taught and how it is, how I'm currently teaching it at St. Ambrose. And it's taught within one of our interventions courses within the second year of the program that's related to learning about cognitive interventions, 
uh, sensory integration interventions, as well as vision for this, uh, for this course. And like many, uh, like many other programs, it's very intense in that I have provided information for sensory integration theory and I split it up into two different weeks so that way students can learn about and understand the difference between sensory reactivity and sensory perception. And what I have here is kind of what an average week looks like when learning about this theory, but uh, what's a little bit different than today, today is Treatment Tuesday. We always uh, take on Assessment Day Tuesday. So while Monday they're provided information related to sensory integration reactivity and uh, just understanding the theory and practice of sensory integration, Tuesdays are information related to assessments and understanding what assessments can be utilized with those clients. And then on Wednesdays, interventions that can address uh, those deficits that were noted or difficulties noted. And then on Thursday, we pull all that information together, utilizing a data-driven decision-making model. So I wanted to provide a slide of its own on this data-driven decision-making model because this is a great model to be utilized with students. And I was actually introduced to this model when I was in my post-professional uh, program and found it very useful as a clinician as well in working through the child's strengths as well as participation challenges. And so this model was developed by uh, Dr. Roseanne Schaff and has been utilized with Dr. Schaff and Dr. Mayu as well in, in literature. And this model, what it helps students to do as well as clinicians, is, is to take you through the entire OT process, but in a very specific strategic way. And so I'll just talk through some of the few points here, just as starting off with understanding the st participation strengths and challenges of the child. And then in our case, we've identified that these children would benefit from air sensory integration theory, followed by assessments to, that are related to air sensory integration theory. And based on that ass assessment information, followed with generating that hypothesis of what could be challenging for those individuals and going on from there to developing your goals and outcome measures, as well as setting your stage for an intervention and conducting that intervention. So I'm not going into the intervention piece as in depth right now, because I know that Sarah Sawyer will be talking on that intervention component in clinicians, but this is a great model to help you um, really think about the entire OT process from evaluation, treatment intervention to outcome measure. So based on the information that I provided that's within the classes that I've taught, our students, as well as many edu students finishing their doctoral or master's degree in occupational therapy, they'll be at that entry level readiness for learning and understanding about air sensory integration. So they'll be able, they'll have that introduction to the seminal work of aging airs, and they'll have an understanding of the sensory con contributions to development, including those concepts of body centered sensations and sensory and motor skills and praxis. As well, as well as understanding the sensory challenges, including reactivity, perception, postural and motor skills and praxis. And they'll know when to refer on to a professional with a postgraduate specialization in ASI. So this is the beginning level that many of our students have. And so if you're a fieldwork educator or if you're in academia, this uh, could be very helpful information as you think about tools and resources that you could utilize in, in, guiding the, um, in guiding your teachings when working with students who are interested in utilizing air sensor integration uh, when it's deemed appropriate. So at this time, I will go ahead and let Sarah Sawyer talk a little bit on um, taking this to the next level. Great. Thank you, Jenny. I did, um, before I jump in, it's 
first of all, let me say how wonderful it is to be here with you all. Um, I did see a message that said maybe the screen was partially covered. Is that is that okay? Are we good to keep moving forward? Do we think it looks good for everybody? It's your um, panel view. If you could make your panel view smaller, it won't block the screen so much. Oh, it, right. Sorry, it wasn't me. I think it was a comment that somebody had, had mentioned. But, yeah, well, um, it, it, it's going to happen with Jenny's panel view. So Jenny, if you minimize your panel view, it will um, lessen. Oh, okay. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, okay. Is that good? Is that, is that look good? Okay. Do you want to um, just move us on, Jenny? Thank you for having the slides for me. So I, as Jenny mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little more about, um, so what happens now? You know, you've had this great education in occupational therapy and hopefully it has really contained some great information as Jenny shared with us about sensory integration, but also about all the other components that are involved in being uh, NOT. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit with you about um, how do we progress? How do we move through this journey of learning to become the clinician that we really want to be. And this is the stuff that really excites me. Um, I really like to talk to people about, you know, what are your professional goals? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up, mm -hmm. right? None of us really know, but we're all working on it. Um, and it, it's never too early to have these conversations with yourself. You know, what is my goal? What's my what, what's my goal for the next year for myself? What's the goal for the next five years? You know, I, I don't always have a five-year plan. Maybe I never have a five-year plan, but you know, it's good to try and think about having one. And I think as you move from academia into, you know, as in being a student, I should say, into being a clinician, a real live clinician, starting to think about where am I and it can be maybe on the chart that Jenny shared with us about you know where am I on this learning trajectory of ASSI um, and you know where am I with my own learning because you know ASSI is a part of me being an OT right and I need to be a good colleague and I need to have good time management and I need to have you know be able to have good writing skills and all of these different components so really thinking about where you are now um, in this journey is really, really important. And as you start to maybe apply for jobs or maybe you've been in a job for a while and you're starting to thinking about a shift, you know, thinking about the culture of the environment that you are in. And this to me is huge with regards to um, progressing within this particular area. You know, where am I? Am I by myself in a facility? Am I working with a variety of clinicians that are also utilizing an ASI approach? You know, are they not, but they're interested in learning? Who are the peers that I'm working with? And what is the facility that I'm at? You know, will the facility help me to reach the goals that I have for my clinical work? Or, you know, will it, um, you know, will it be sort of more of a struggle? It doesn't mean to say you won't necessarily move into that area, but you know, to really be aware and know what kind of um, environment I'm moving into. And maybe it's a takeaway from this, you know, everybody to do a little reflection on, you know, what is my environment right now? And how does my environment support me in my learning um, in the goals that I have to be? I'll use that, that term master clinician very loosely, right? Because, you know, who decides what the master level clinician is, right? The best clinician you can be. And really meeting the needs of the clients that you're working with um, and really meeting your own needs and your own goals with regards to your learning for sure. So I want to talk a little bit today about these sort of three branches. And I think about this a lot with the therapists that I work with at OTA. Um, we really think about what are the courses, what are the trainings that's available to us in order to help us on this journey? What's the research that's out there and that's available and what's my own engagement in research? And then also mentoring. Um, you know, am I involved in mentoring, um, being the mentor, am I a mentee? And how can we really utilize mentoring in order to help us on this journey? 
So thinking a little bit, first of all, about um, competence through knowledge, courses, trainings, learnings, there's a lot of different types of, well, there's certainly a lot of courses out there. And I would encourage everybody to be, um, you know, an educated consumer of the courses that are out there. You know, really think about, we all have limited resources. We all have limited time. Really think about the courses that you're attending. Look into who's providing the courses. Who are the courses hosted by? And um, these are all really great, great questions to ask when you're thinking about taking a course to move you along this ASI journey. Also thinking about the type of course that it is. Really thinking about, you know, is this a sit down, let somebody talk to me and share information with me? Is this an observation type course where I'm going to be maybe observing treatment? I'm going to be observing um, you know, different components for ASI, different components for being an OT, um, or is this a hands-on doing course? Um, and I think we all have different learning styles and really reflecting and thinking about what's my learning style and how do I learn best should really guide the courses that you choose to take. And um, we've all been limited, of course, with um, you know, with the pandemic and with the Zoom learning in so many ways, it's opened up so many doors. We can all be all over the world, um, but it's also made it a little harder. We have to be much more selective to make sure that we are really attending and spending time learning at courses that are really providing us with the information that we want. And then a little plug here for sharing what you know. I think there's nothing more um, enlightening maybe than telling somebody else what you know, whether it be a student OT, whether it be a colleague, where, whether it be you know, a supervisor. Um, we have a model at OTA where our clinicians share maybe a case study at a small um, staff meeting, and then maybe they go out and present at a preschool. They'll have a student, different levels of students, and I think um, being able to teach somebody, being able to explain to somebody, this is the reason that I did what I just did. Um, mm -hmm. It's validating for you as a clinician. And it's just, you know, it really embeds this knowledge base that we have. You know, you don't get through OT school without being a pretty smart cookie. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of knowledge in there. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, sort of the, the dance of knowledge and intervention. Um, and actually, maybe if you just jump onto the next slide for me, Jenny, I'll, I'll do that while this slide is up. And this is not my slide. This was a slide that I sort of, um, I was actually looking for some quotes. And um, I really like this, this quote. It, it is presented in a number of different ways, right? I see and I forget. I hear and I remember. I do and I understand. Um, and this just, this speaks to my learning style. Um, and it also, to me, speaks to the work that we do with the children that we treat and about the fact that, you know, our goal is to engage the children, to engage that inner drive, to really support the children, to engage in the work, which is play for them, of course. And, you know, I really think about um, as you move forward on this journey, of knowing more about SI, you often spend more time in this sort of cognitive place when it comes to treatment. Um, and those of you that have been a therapist for a long time, you will have done this sort of pull push of this, I just learned something new, I'm in my brain, oh, I can move out of my brain and I can really be in the moment with this child and then I'm back in, you know, back into my cognitive again and now I'm back into this um, real sort of fun um, engagement with the child. And I think it's something that we need to talk about because when you first um, come out of school, you're very much in your thinking brain. And it takes a lot of effort to move out of that thinking brain and into your fun brain to really interact mm -hmm. with the children that you're working with. And there's this dance that happens. You know, you're trying to keep the child emotionally safe, physically safe. You're trying to keep yourself physically safe. You're trying to think about the goals. You're trying to think about the insurance. You've got a mom watching you and she has no idea what you're doing. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful. But, you know, when we think about 
how we allow ourselves to move to this place of confidence in a session, which looks so easy at times, we really need to know the theory and we really need to understand the theory to be able to move into this dance, to be able to move into this real pure model of, of therapy. And so I'm sharing sort of a lot of different sort of themes here with you, but this slide to me really speaks to reflecting yourself on how you learn and reflecting on how you turn what you learn into practice. You know, what ends up happening a lot at OTA is we end up supporting the therapist to maybe not take that third course this year because it's great to have that knowledge, but you need to be able to put that knowledge into play, literally, in the treatment space. And so really thinking about, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the best thing to do to go to 27 courses, right, where you're sitting there and someone's talking at you and giving you a lot of information. Let's really be educated consumers and think about, am I gonna get hands-on in this course? Am I gonna get to watch observations? Am I gonna get to break down different profiles in order to be able to support me to be able to then take that back to practice? And just a couple of, um, you know, these names are probably names you guys are all familiar with. Um, the International Council for Education in ASI, ACC, you know, is definitely a place to um, to look for, you know, if you're looking for courses, of course, Classy, um, you know, we're going to look to Classy for, for courses. And there, there are a lot of courses, and this might come up as a question, or we can maybe talk about this a little. Um, we're thinking about, you know, how do we decide what's the right course to take? And how do we make sure that the information that we're learning is relevant to ASI? Did you, I saw you were muted, Suzanne. Did you want to jump in there? No, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. I'm listening. Okay. I love everything okay. you're saying. <laughs> okay, good. Sorry. It's a lot. I know. <laughs> I'm excited. Can you tell? I love this stuff. Um, all right. There's my little cone of, there is a reference there at the bottom. Sorry. I think we're covering it up, but I can definitely send you that, um, send you that reference. So research, um, you know, we got to talk research when we're with this group, right? Um, and of course we should all be thinking about, um, about research because I think there is this piece as a, um, you know, as a therapist, as somebody who's in the clinic every day, of like, there's no way I possibly have time for research. We need to be educated on the research that's out there. I need to be aware of the latest research, the research that supports ASI, the research that doesn't support ASI, the research that's looking at neuroplasticity in different fields to OT, it's so exciting. Um, you know, the research that's looking at ADL skills and insurance reimbursement and how do we support and build a model that, you know, is accessible to um, our clients. And so staying current with research is a huge component of moving forward on your journey to being an ASI clinician and being able to be the best therapist that you can be. And I think you can do this in so many ways, you know, obviously join in. Um, sort of the major organizations that you can access, um, a lot of libraries now you can access, you know, different um, universities um, to access sort of their research databases, um, become members of your local special interest group. If you don't have a local special interest group, create one, um, you know, think about lunch times, reviewing research articles. Nobody has the time to read, you know, everybody, we've all got this pile. Um, but divide and conquer, um, you know, read the, read the abstracts um, and really try and stay um, engaged and up on the research that's happening. And actually social media has been helpful for that. It's also been somewhat um, overwhelming for that, hasn't it? That we've all been bombarded with information, but, you know, can also be really helpful. And then participating in research. And this doesn't need to be, I mean, of course, you know, everybody that's on this call sign up to help, um, you know, with the development of the easy, right? Got it in there, Zoe, she can pay me, I promise. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be a huge undertaking. It could be to help review, you know, the paperwork. It could be um, your own case study. There's nothing more powerful now. And we know this with levels of research. Jenny could talk to us more about this, I know, with regards to, um, you know, a case study about the journey of a child through their treatment 
um, you know, treatment journey can be so powerful. Um, it doesn't need to, you don't need to think about embarking upon this huge study in order to be able to um, participate in research. Reach out to your local colleges. You know, they are always looking for participants. If you have a small clinic, if you're working in a school system, um, you know, that's another great way to really engage in research. And it's that piece that I think as a clinician, we are often scared by, but I think that we all have a part to play in this. Um, and so, you know, I really wanna see us thinking about that with regards to our progression to a better clinician, right? Um, and then this sort of third um, area that I wanted to, to talk to you about, which is very near and dear to my heart is mentoring and is um, this um, competence through mentoring. And I do think mentoring is so underutilized clinically um, with regards to our own learning and with regards to really supporting growth of your peers. You know, if you have um, a staff with regards to, um, you know, supervisors and um, students and mentoring can mean so many different things. Um, and I think there's all, often this sort of notion that um, I need to be mentored and I need to be mentored by somebody who has this like vast amount of knowledge. And I think often the best mentoring that happens is, you know, your cubby mate that sat next to you. That was the best session ever. Let's talk about it. That was the worst session. I have no idea what happened. Um, let's hope it never happens again. You know, this, there's lots of different levels of mentoring. And if you're, if after hearing this sort of information on this slide, if you don't think that you're engaged in mentoring, please start to sort of reflect and think about, um, you know, how can I, how can I move into a model of mentoring? And so some of the different sort of styles of mentoring, there are formal models, and I am actually, in a little bit, I'm gonna to present to you a formal model that we use at OTA um, with regards to sort of on-site specific um, mentor-mentee relationships that are very um, sort of parallel. There's no hierarchical model. And um, it's really, um, it, it's very formal in that our clinicians all have a set time every week to meet with their mentors. They have treatment mentors, they have evaluation mentors. It's the same person every week that they meet with. Um, and I'll talk you through our model um, in a little bit, just so that you can sort of see that in practice. And then um, informal models. I know a lot of facilities, sort of even similar facilities to OTA that have what I would consider more of an informal mentoring model. So maybe they do have some senior clinicians that have time on their schedule and you as a clinician could maybe pop in to see them if you have a problem. And this is sort of my, um, a little bit of my concern with this model is that often the mentoring is only utilized for the problems. It's not utilized to share the joy. It's not utilized to share the, what is your five year plan? What is your education you know, plan? What are your goals? Um, and so an informal mentoring model, I think is utilized in many facilities and can be wonderful, certainly better than the no model, but um, you, know, you really wanna make sure that you have access um, to a peer or to um, not a supervisor because a supervisor is a different relationship to a mentor. A mentor is somebody who can be with you in the successes and in the challenges and not judge you for that. Um, not that a supervisor necessarily would, but you know, it's a different, um, it's a different relationship. And then offsite mentors, um, maybe you're the only therapist on, you know, at your site. And so you have a mentor offsite that you have access to. Maybe you are interested in or have engaged in some sort of distance mentoring. Um, I know Annie um, Balthazar Mori and I believe Asia um, Rowley have done some work with this sort of distance mentoring um, and are utilizing sort of Facebook and sort of creating groups of clinicians that can support each other. We do have a distance mentoring model at the Spiral Foundation as well. It's it's always tricky. There are financial constraints for sure, but I think um, you know this sort of um, times of technology are only going to sort of help us in that. Um, and then other forms of mentoring involve clinical discussions, um, you know, case study presentations, on-site trainings. We do a lot of shared meetings at OTA where we sort of might share. If we've been to a training, we might come back and share and do hands-on trainings for staff. 
observations, there, there was sort of this notion, it's interesting that, um, you know, new staff did observations of more experienced staff. And we sort of debunked that. You've got a cancellation. You want to come join my session? Like, come join my session. There's nothing more, um, I was going to use the word beautiful. Maybe it is the word beautiful, but to watch a session unfold, but not be in it, you know, to watch it happen and be able to think, oh, I wonder what they're going to do next. I wonder where they're going to go next. And, you know, sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. Um, but once you have a full caseload and once you're doing full of owls, it's really hard to, to do that reflection. Um, and a lot of learning in ASI is reflection, um, you know, and is really thinking about where do I want to go with this child and how can I get the child there? Um, so observations, you know, that could be a great place to start with regards to your mentoring journey. And then I already sort of mentioned this a little bit, the peer mentoring piece, you know, doesn't have to be a master level clinician that mentors you. It could be, you know, going for a cup of coffee. Of course, I was going to say a glass of wine, but I changed it to a cup of coffee with, um, you know, Susie that sits next to you in your, in your cube, um, you know. I'm a big advocate to take a proper lunch break and not talk shop, but like we're OTs, we love this stuff, right? There's nothing better than talking about what went great during that session. And that is another opportunity to really learn. Um, and the power of peer mentoring, I think is very much um, underestimated. So if you just jump ahead, Jenny, I'll just sort of, I'm not gonna spend any real time on this. I can certainly share this with anybody that would like to see it. Mentoring has been in place and I need to stop talking pretty quickly. I'm, I'm almost there. Um, mentoring has been in place at OTA um, thanks to, you know, Dr. Kumar. And I, of course, had the, you know, the best mentor out there um, in Dr. Kumar. But she, um, she started mentoring the day she opened the doors at OTA. What we found was we wanted to make sure with the development of this model that people were really receiving this sort of holistic approach to mentoring. So, yes, it's really about um, becoming a skilled clinician, but it's also about understanding relationships with your leadership team, with you becoming a leader, um, you know, with the responsibilities within the organization, with this bigger picture vision of the organization that you're part of and hopefully supporting the success of, as well as sort of more of the soft skills piece. You know, if your time management isn't maybe as great as your clinical skills and that can start to, to impact your performance. So when we think about moving towards this, um, you know, this really skilled clinician, um, these are the different components that we address within our, um, within our mentoring model. And then I think that brings us through, Jenny, if you wanna sort of jump us on to um, my little bit of like soapboxy stuff maybe. Um, this was good timing. It, it was the Boston Marathon yesterday. Um, I wasn't running in it. You won't find me in this picture, unfortunately. Although I did. And we watched a couple of marathons, Zoe and Suzanne, when you were with us in Boston, didn't we? Um, but this is my sort of, um, you know, this is my um, note to pace yourself. Um, you know, it takes time and patience to integrate this very complex model. You are not going to become... Um, you can be a skilled clinician from day one, of course you can, but you're not going to be able to, you know, treat every single child with every single profile um, in the way that maybe you want to on day one. So pace your learning, really think about um, how you learn best, how you embed this information and how can you access what's available to you in order to move forward on this journey. Don't underestimate the power of hands-on doing um, you know, these treatment courses um, are really, really, really powerful. Um, so access those when you can. Learn from your peers. Let your clients support your learning. Um, I remember very distinctly for me sort of oral motor work. And I had a client who was very early on in my career and, and he didn't really come up for a couple of weeks that he didn't really eat anything. He was probably three and he was, you know, still mainly on liquids. It's like, okay, we need to change our intake forms. But um, you know, that was the time for me to sort of dive into oral motor work a little bit more and, you know, let the clients lead your learning because there's nothing more empowering than, um, not that you, you know, you shouldn't take the courses and learn and know the theory ahead of time, but I think there's something very powerful in um, having um, clients that really need your help and, you know, can really motivate you in your learning. Set your intention, whether it's 
those five minutes in the session, whether it's the next year of your career progression, whether it's where you wanna be in 20 years, this is Jane speaking right now, set your intention and make that happen um, and have fun. Because if nothing else, you know, this approach is fun. So um, if, you know, if you have fun in the session, you could probably, probably assume that the child that's with you is having fun too. Um, and you can, you know, you've got all that theory and all that knowledge and you can push it back a little bit to have some fun with your, with your clients. So, and then Jenny, thank you, Jenny, put up some, um, some references here and I can certainly add a couple, a couple onto this. So I'll take a breath there. There's a lot of information. Thank you both so much. So many important ideas and topics. You both have just had me thinking so much about Dr. Ayers in your comments. Um, you know, I was thinking about her four month training course that she developed and I, you know, just obviously in her brilliance, she knew that people really needed to do this work themselves. And every four months, a new group of people would come in the first day they were there, they would be treating children. And I think they were often a little shocked, like what I have a caseload today. <laughs> but she knew that the only way you get it is in your body by doing. And same thing with the assessments, you know, we are constantly being asked, can you show me how to do this? No, just, just do it, <laughs> do it yourself. Yeah, I agree. I loved, I loved all of it. You know, Jane and I were mentored by Ginny Scardina and Jane took that to heart and moved forward and never forgot that in terms of, you know, what you've, you, you've got to teach to learn. So here's your topic, go teach it. And you find out really quickly that you don't know, you don't know very much. And, and then you've got to do it. You got to set it up and do it to really understand it. And then you've got to do it more than once. You've got to keep trying. So yeah, it's, it's great to see you carrying on Jane's legacy and Jenny that the, you know, what's interesting in my thinking about the, the entry level programs and the basic programs in OT is the fabulous thing is that there is some introduction to sensory integration in almost all the programs. And that that's so huge. But the programs are really designed to be, you know, for OTs to be generalists. And there's no room in the curricula, and this isn't a criticism, that it's just there's no room to be a specialist in all the many tools we have, whether it's hand therapy or spinal cord or, or dementia or you know CP or whatever it is. And so with sensory integration as a specialty, it does take additional training in order to really do the deep dive. Of course, I think you could get it on a superficial level, for example, like hand therapy, I could, I can think about it on a superficial level, but nobody would want to trust me to work. <laughs> <laughs> or neonatology, you know, any of those specialty areas, you, you've got to do a deep dive. And I think that that's, that's the piece of sensory integration too, as, as you're you know, graduating your students, and then how do you light the passion, you know, you know, are, is there interest? If there's not interest, this isn't this isn't the right specialty for you. But as you ignite that passion, and I certainly had that as an undergraduate, I was like, I I just wanted more and more and more and more. Still, I still wish I knew more. That's that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree that everyone everyone's in their own spot on this journey. And so Sarah gave some wonderful ideas and tips as to what can be utilized and take what, what's best for you, depending on where you're at in this journey with building your competence in ASI. And, you know, one of you made the, I think Sarah made the comment about research um, participating or, you know, look for partners. And Jenny, you've been so brave in just deciding to, to try. I, and I, I know that you've learned that it's not easy because I've, I've seen it happen <laughs> by your side. But 
you know, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that. You've, um, you know, you have your students and you've decided to launch some test retest studies and you jumped in with data collection. I wonder if you have any tips about that or ideas being at a university and knowing that clinicians always want to find ways to participate in research. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, while I was in the post-professional doctorate was when I had started the initial participation in normative data collection. And at that time, I was working part-time at an outpatient pediatric clinic. And it was really the, you know, you are, you are great friends with all those clinicians around you. They are your support system. You talk with them. You have a strong relationship with them. And of course, um, being in a setting like that, they, they were right there along with me to support me in assisting with that development and, and uh, assisting with data collection of children, of uh, typically developing children. So that was a great start is I did want to embark on this, this endeavor and just talking amongst the other clinicians around sparked the same idea. Uh, they felt comfortable and confident through, as I was guiding them through the guidance that I had uh, through you, Dr. Mayu. <laughs> and so that was a great way though for our entire clinic to get involved in the data collection. So that was one piece. And then now, since I have transitioned more into uh, teaching, what's great is there are a number of students, actually we were doing um, some interviews the other day and there were undergrad students that already knew about air sensory integration, which I just thought was great that um, the word is getting out there. But with students then that have already identified that they want to know more about this theory, they want to know more how to utilize it. For those students, they do have the opportunity to participate in data collection where I'm overseeing them uh, and they're learning the easy assessment. And again, it's, it's not necessarily the easiest thing for them because this is the first time that they're really diving into assessment, but through some guidance, through mentorship, they feel comfortable, they feel confident. And our plan is that those students will be able to test children and then retest them. Uh, so that way we can look at test retest results there. So it's been great to see this on a clinician level I encourage anyone that is interested in doing it, start talking with other clinicians because together you guys can be a strong force. And even in academia, if you have an interest to um, include your students because they are excited to participate in this. And I cannot tell you, we've already had one round of students go through uh, two years ago at that point because it was pre-COVID and those students continue to say that they have learned so much through participating in that development of the assessment. So they were able to learn skills beyond that general education information. That's so cool. You, you know, as an undergrad, I remember being taken to um, a meeting <laughs> and I met Wilma West and I was like, I thought that was a library. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here with William West. They named the library after her. And, and but you know we were we were taken to meetings as undergraduates and met these incredible people who treated us with respect and always were like well you're the future you know you, we've got these bright little cookies here and you guys have to I feel like that now with with our students you just see these shining stars and you know they're the future of the profession and you just but if they get exposed to these exciting projects, it also breaks up the monotony of day-to-day -day work or you know, treat after treat after treat after treatment. Um, so it's, it's such a gift that you were able to expose your students in that way. I wonder if uh, Sarah, if you might take a look at that uh, question in the chat. Can you see that? Um, there's uh, Amy is asking about creative ideas on how to improve the balance of uh, therapist full caseloads with mentoring. And all of this, it, there's never enough time and there's certainly never enough money <laughs> for anything, but. Um, <laughs> right, right. It, it really is. Um, 
It really is tough. I mean, if you're sort of um, talking with sort of supervisors and, you know, people that hold the schedules there, it, it surprises me how many people look at mentoring as a benefit to the clinician, which of course it is. But I think what people forget about mentoring is that it benefits the organization as a whole. You know, and of course it benefits the clients, but you know, when we have, we have a lot of very complex clients that come to us at OTA. And if we didn't have the comprehensive mentoring model in place, we wouldn't be able to see those clients because the staff just wouldn't be able, I mean, they might try. I mean, they wouldn't at Kumar Center because we wouldn't let them, but you know, some places they do try. We know that happens um, and you can do more harm than good. So I think the message here is mentoring isn't just, you know, in the best interest of the clinician, it's in the best interest of the organization. Um, you know, it also, I mean, from a hiring standpoint, I can't tell you how many clinicians, you know, come to us because they know of our mentoring model. Um, and maybe we can't always, you know, we're a private practice. We can't always compete with the large hospitals. We can't from a reimbursement state for, for salary. We can't always compete with the school systems. Um, you know, and everyone's having to stay till seven o'clock to get the kids after school. Like there are, you know, there's these little downsides, but, um, you know, if you're, if, if this is your passion, then a mentoring model, it will support retention. It will support hiring. It will, um, you know, allow you to see a wider variety of clients. So keep those, you know, those intakes coming in and then you provide a better service. Um, and that, you know, if that doesn't feed the organization, then, um, you know, so th that's, I think, the message that we need to give um, in order to, to really try, you know, it might be an hour less production, but when, let's, look, let's look past that, which I know it's hard to do. Um, you know, let's look at this bigger picture piece. Such an important point, though, Sarah, and I think we're always trying to find ways to help therapists advocate for themselves, for the profession. You know, we probably as a whole, we probably don't do a good enough job in documenting some of these things. You know, we, if we got creative about it, we probably could document even the financial benefit. Um, right. If we, you know, the things that you're talking about, they do improve the practice. They, in, they increase, um, you know, keeping therapists. So you don't have to spend as much time looking for new therapists. There are cost savings. Right. It's, it's a little bit the way that we talk about the need to do assessment when therapists say, oh, I don't have enough time. I only get 10 minutes for an assessment. Well, then that's probably going to create too much time in therapy that's not focused or effective. So this is a, you know, it's a, it is a challenge for all of us, but I think we all could be thinking about ways to document the cost benefit of making our work better. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and, you know, I think the other thing that, that happens as you move in, in your level of experience is you go from kind of consuming the knowledge to critical reasoning, you know, critically analyzing the, the material, the appropriateness and, and your, your thinking, that thinking that you have um, becomes refined alongside the addition of your uh, of your of being facile in your use of the tools right so then you can and then you see what's coming out in the research and you go well that doesn't really make a lot of sense but like look at that that's really important and and you bring that back into to your work and and so it's like a constant layering of your skills and abilities or knowledge and skills to, to guide your reasoning. And then it's really nice to have somebody to, you know, bounce those ideas off of. Like, am I really going off track here? Are you seeing this? You know, did you read this? And then, and, and I think it moves you into another level of your, you know, professional and clinical reasoning. Right. Can, I know we're short on time. We're almost um, in an hour, but, we have a lot of international participants today and, and you know, I've studied in Portugal and studying now in the U.S. And, and there's two different realities there, actually, regarding mentoring. 
So my question, uh, maybe both Jenny and, and Sarah can address that, was that how can we start that mentality where there's not a, a history of mentorship and, and relationship between mentor and mentee? Is there any tips that you can give to people that want to be mentored or want to be mentors? Because that's also important. You'll learn a lot with that too. Yeah, I mean, I think if it's okay to sort of jump in, Jenny, and then I'll let you sort of jump in right after. Um, I, I think it's sort of that piece about um, the advantages that come with mentoring, right? And I, it, it's interesting, Mark, I, I, you know, maybe need to understand a little more about, um, you know, I'm trying to think back to my days as a, we used to, we used to be called basic grade OTs when you first came out of school in, in um in England, and the I, you did a rotation around sort of different um, locations, and of course I was, I was already negotiating to like I would go to the hospital that nobody wanted to go to if I could get this SI placement, you know. But we did have mentoring in the UK at that point in time, um, and it was probably aligned with this um, sort of new grad um, piece. I'm not quite, you know, so familiar with. You describe sort of in Portugal and this sort of this 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 um, maybe this sort of um, approach of it's not valuable to have a mentor or maybe it's more hierarchical like you need to be this you know sort right. of grandiose individual is that more the right I think I think you touching a point there is very important is sometimes we see mentorship that we we need to have like a person that is really establish it on the field but i've learned a lot with like jenny was saying with peers and you know and people that were one ahead or two years ahead in experience um right. and do, do, is there a value on that is that is something that we can start building before we go to this there beginning? is there yeah uh, so much so much so much in just connecting with colleagues connecting with people that are in a similar facility to you you know to that you're working in and the other piece that I would say is you know if you are a mentor or if you're aspiring to be a mentor you know it's I get so I'm a mentor but I'm also a mentee you know right. I still treat clients I am still a mentee I love I crave my you know if someone's grabbing a coffee like I'm there like so what do you think about like all the time like forget that paperwork I want to chat about this kiddo but the other piece is for us to reflect on if you feel like you can't ask a question of your mentor, then that's the wrong mentor for you. I mean, you know, oh, a really one. quick side story. <laughs> my first ever sip was Jane Kumar's daughter. I know she wouldn't mind me saying this, but my practice sipped. Like, what? But like, there wasn't a wrong question. You know, there wasn't a wrong discussion. There wasn't a wrong, like, she, she knew what she knew and never once did she make me feel that I didn't know just as much as she knew. But she guided me to find that my answers and that's, you know, so that's the other piece here. I'm sure there are many, many people on this call that maybe have never thought of themselves as a mentor. You are mentors. I bet you're doing it every day indirectly. Um, it, you know, it doesn't need to be you sit down. I mean, please don't sit down on the opposite side of the desk to your mentees. You know, it's a conversation. It's learning. It's reflecting. It's talking about those successes. It's talking about the worst session you ever had. And, you know, thank goodness that one's done with um so I think that's the mentality that we need to move into sure the pretty mentoring model is lovely and it served us quite well from a from a you know an organizational standpoint but I think we start small um and and go from there sorry Jenny I really didn't stop to let you say anything did I <laughs> I think you I think you covered it very well <laughs> and there's apps you know just to solidify there's absolutely a positive impact that that can be had by just even that peer to peer mentorship that you uh, had identified earlier. Thank you so much. Well, we we have we don't want to miss out on our prizes. No. <laughs> and on, on announcements of next time, but thank you both so much. What inspiring and thought provoking ideas. It's just a pleasure to be with you always. And we so much appreciate you sharing with the world here. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. So but before- Your mentorship extends beyond the people in your direct sphere. Now you're influencing so many people. Thank you so much. Okay, Marco. <laughs> right, I'm sorry, Suzanne, but before we go to prizes, actually we have a new announcement. 
I'm gonna share it with oh, you. Yes. And here we go. Suzanne, will you do the honors? Yes, you know what? Um, we are planning to hold our conference in person in July in Redondo Beach. You see the dates here, the 14th through the 16th. And, you know, this is something we put off. We were planning to celebrate Dr. O's 100th birthday in 2020, but that didn't happen. And then last year, that didn't happen. So we're, we're determined. So I hope all of you can join us in person or virtually. We're going to have an amazing lineup of speakers, but this is, this is a for sure, it's a go. And barring any unforeseen circumstances, we are ready <laughs> to, to see everybody for a big professional party in July. And the, um, the, just the topic, the topic is the sensory neural foundations for social connection. We thought that that was, we were ready for that. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and now we're going to our giveaways. And are you still seeing my screen? Yes. Brewery Mountain, California, do you see that? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Okay, so our easy starter kit winner is Anna Marie Brand. Congratulations. Actually, I believe. Congratulations. She's no longer on. So our, oh. new, our new winner. Oh. <laughs> okay. We have a new winner. Uh -oh. So Anne-Marie left? Yes, yeah, she left. Oh. So our new winner is Annette Ryan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Annette Ryan. Ryan. Congratulations. You left. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. And now our subpa winner right. for the piece of right. equipment and right. i hope they didn't <laughs> maybe you better check with melissa first <laughs> that would be that this, would be one, this one should still be correct <laughs> all right so congratulations marcella lascano congratulations on winning congratulations this amazing wow. piece of equipment and thank you subpa for that mark is not here with us today but thank you so much for all the support and Suzanne, do you want to? Yes, well, you in? know, um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. It means so much. Um, we have two more webinars left in this series. One will be on November 9th, and we have Dr. Isabel Baudry and Dr. Margaret Bauman, and, and they're amazing people, and we're going to be talking about healthy habits and toileting and fecal incontinence and what to do about that. <laughs> it's a and health, just general health. And then our last one in this series will be December 7th with Tina Champagne. And we're going to talk about also health um, with, with a focus on mental health and trauma and attachment where she's been immersed in that for many years. So we're very excited. Hopefully you guys can all join us and stay safe, everybody. Is it a different time next time, Suzanne? Oh, yes. Sorry, it'll be at 10, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. I don't know if it's standard time. What's, or what's the date? I think it's uh, November 9th. Okay, that'll be right after the time change. So it'll be okay. Pacific right. standard time. Pacific 10 a.m. So it'll be maybe better for some of our friends, but Isabel's in Spain and we thought that was a little torturous to right. have her come in the middle of the night. But then we'll be back at 5 p.m. for the last one. Thank you for reminding us. Okay. And for pe if people want to check the real time on when we send the announcement, we'll have this little link where they can check their time zone wherever they are in the world. So All right. They can use Thank that you. to make sure. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you for thank joining you. us, everyone. And Sarah Great and Jenny, you. thank you so much. so much. You thank guys you. are the best. And Mark Bowen, Zoe, everybody, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. All right. Stop recording right now.